America is often called the greatest nation on earth because of its melting pot of cultures and heritages lasting hundreds of years. When you travel across the United States, you'll meet a wide range of people. But what is even more diverse than the people of America is its nature. From mountain ranges to massive lakes, you can find a bit of the world in every part of the United States. Of course, with diverse nature, you will also get a variety of animals, from friendly, harmless critters to some of the most dangerous animals you can encounter. We will be talking about the second group today, more specifically, bears. These three people ventured into remote parts of the United States and came face to face with the full furry force of nature in all its might. Story 1. Clarence Bates The great outdoors is fantastic on paper. You commune with nature and enjoy your own company in solitude. This was the type of life that Clarence Bates enjoyed the most. He was a retired police officer living in Montana with his daughter and their dog, Yoda. Since he didn't have much to do during the day, Clarence took the opportunity to build a small cabin on some land he owned in the woods, about a 30-minute drive from his hometown. It was a small project at first, setting logs down on key points across the plateau and going from there. But after months and months of effort, the cabin was complete, along with a few tables here and there for get-togethers. Yoda would often accompany him on his trips to the cabin and run around as free as can be. Although this part of Montana was fairly remote, it didn't have too many bear sightings, maybe a few a year. This is why Clarence was never worried when he went to his happy place in the mountains. However, this would change when on March 7, 2012, Clarence found himself stuck between a furious black bear and a hard place. Clarence drove his pickup to the cottage early in the morning with Yoda, who was desperate for a run. They pulled up as close as they could and went the rest of the way on foot for a few minutes, leaving what they didn't need in the back of the truck. As Clarence approached the cabin, he picked up a small log and threw it for Yoda to fetch. Something to note about Clarence's dog is that he was an all-black German Shepherd, so this log was the size of a baseball bat. While the dog was having fun, Clarence took the opportunity to unload some tools so he could work on tiling the small kitchen area of the cabin and got to work. He was tiling for about 20 minutes before he heard some commotion outside and walked out. He saw something in the back of his truck and rushed forward, yelling for whatever it was to get away. As he moved closer to the truck, the shape in the back of it was made clear and Clarence realized he was yelling at and moving toward a huge black bear eating the food he had left behind. The bear spotted him and started charging toward him. He stumbled back, clutching the hammer as the bear loomed over him and crashed into his chest, pinning him to the ground. Before he could process what had happened, the bear bit into his shoulder, tearing it apart and making him scream in agony. Despite being 60 years old, Clarence was a fit and strong man, so he summoned all his strength and started hammering the bear's head with a hammer, but the beast didn't even flinch. The bear released his shoulder and went for his neck in response to the hammering. Clarence managed to jam his arm in the way of the bear's jaws, delaying his death long enough for Yoda to hear the commotion from the woods and run to his master's aid. Clarence clenched his teeth as the bear bit through the tendons in his arm and broke both his ulna and radius bones. The pain was immense, but Clarence only focused on Yoda running towards them in the corner of his eye. The powerful dog ran straight for the bear and bit its leg, causing it to loosen its grip on Clarence. It let go of his arm and moved towards the dog, growling and grunting as it did so. Clarence didn't dare to move knowing he had no use of his arms to fend off the bear. He lay down and prayed that Yoda would scare the beast away. His head fell back, and all he could hear was intense barking and growling, losing tone as it moved away. When he could no longer hear the barking, he slowly propped himself up to get to his truck in safety. His arms were seared in pain, oozing blood, but not enough to be life-threatening. Each step was agony as pain surged with every moment. He slowly opened the truck door with his non-broken arm and climbed into the driver's seat. 
As he sat down, he saw Yoda running on the path leading back to the cabin, so he whistled for the dog to come to him. As Yoda got closer, he saw that the bear was still chasing him. When the dog jumped through the truck's open door, Clarence started it and honked the horn, scaring the bear. It stopped and made a few more threatening steps toward the truck, but the constant honking eventually drove it away. Clarence maneuvered the truck through the woods to the main road, never lifting his hand higher than his stomach because of the pain. Shifting gears was almost impossible due to his broken bones, so he drove in second gear the entire way back. It was horribly slow, but if it meant lessening the pain, that was fine with him. Quinn Clarence arrived at the hospital in his hometown. His shirt was bloodstained, revealing wounds all over his body. He barely remembered parking his truck in front of the hospital before collapsing onto the concrete. Nurses and doctors rushed to his aid when they heard a dog barking persistently in the hospital's parking lot, only to find Clarence lying on the ground, barely alive. He woke up the next day, covered in bandages and surrounded by his daughter and Yoda. His daughter scolded him for going to the cabin alone again, but broke down in tears when she saw the pain in his eyes. She hugged him gently and told him Yoda was sleeping under his bed. The dog had stayed by his side from the moment he collapsed until he recovered. Despite the scars the dog had from the incident, Clarence was proud of Yoda's loyalty. It took him several weeks to fully recover and several months of therapy to overcome the physical and psychological scars of the attack. The following season, Clarence returned to his cabin, but this time with a friend and a high caliber rifle. Story two, Elizabeth Murray. Our next story takes us south of Montana to Wyoming, a state with over 4,000 lakes and excellent sights to see. Elizabeth Murray was a 26-year-old college graduate working at her local post office near Wilson, Montana. She intended to start with a few years of experience and then move to a bigger city for more profitable opportunities. In her spare time, she would often get together with her friends on weekends to visit neighboring towns and do whatever they wanted to relax, be it drinking, the circus, or sports. On April 13, 2007, while enjoying coffee with her friends, Jackie and Albert, the latter proposed that they rent out some ATVs and take them up to Phillips Ridge for fun. The prospect sounded exciting, but Jackie and Elizabeth did not have the proper experience with ATVs to do that. Albert assured them that he could show them the basics and they could take all the time they wanted and that it was easier than they thought. They said that they would think about it. The next day, Albert asked them about it again and Elizabeth said they had decided to try it out. Albert was overjoyed and told Elizabeth that he had already booked the ATVs on a hunch. Later in the day, Elizabeth made her way to the edge of town where Jackie was already waiting for Albert. They both saw him coming from down the road on a single ATV and they admitted among themselves that it did look fun. The two of them squeezed onto Albert's ATV as he took them up the ridge to the point where the other two were set. Albert dismounted and said that he would teach them the basics first. After some practice and a few mistakes, the girls quickly grasped the basics of ATV riding and were easily speeding across the ridge. Since they decided to take on the experience later than ideal, they figured they could stay on the ridge until nightfall and have some food. The trio zoomed across the pass on the ridge, relishing the rush of adrenaline and the thrill of speed as the hours flew by. Before they knew it, the sun had started to set and it got dark, so they decided to take a few more laps before heading home. Tired and unfocused, Elizabeth veered off the track accidentally and hit the side of a large tree, sending her flying down a hill and into the underbrush, lost in stray branches and logs. Albert and Jackie immediately noticed her fall, sped to her location, parked the ATVs, and looked down the hill. Elizabeth had fallen approximately 50 yards down the steep hill. At the bottom of the hill, Elizabeth groggily tried to get up from the logs, but a tremendous pain shot through her leg as she realized it was broken above the knee. She screamed in pain, unable to move, pinned under the logs piled at the bottom of the hill she had no way of freeing herself. 
Each movement she made caused her leg to shock her body with more pain. With no means of escape and daylight dwindling, she screamed for her friends to tell them where she was. They responded kindly, and Albert shouted for her to remain calm as they called for help. He handed his phone to Jackie, who called 911, and went in the direction of the town to bring them to Elizabeth. In the meantime, Albert decided to slowly scale down the hill and see if he could help his friend. Elizabeth sensed movement within the tangle of logs and saw a dark shape through the foliage. As it got closer, a smell intensified, and she could clearly see her visitor. It was a black bear. The beast wasn't as big as some as she had seen before, but it was still imposing and uncomfortably close. As the bear loomed closer, it started sniffing the logs inches away from Elizabeth's face. As it figured out that Elizabeth was a potential meal, it pushed the logs with its paws, but they just pressed on her more, adding to the pain in her leg. Thinking quickly, Elizabeth grabbed a sharp stick beside her and thrust it through the mass of logs directly into the bear's eye. It staggered back and roared, clawing at the logs and making some way to reach her. She screamed in retaliation and kept thrusting the stick into the bear, but it wasn't letting up. To her horror, the bear managed to push its paw through the wood and claw her across her broken leg. She shrieked as the bear's claws ground against her bone, gushing blood all over her leg. At the top of her pain, she heard some commotion from up the hill and realized it was her friends coming to her aid. Albert was accompanied by two paramedics and a police officer who spotted the bear first and swiftly shot it in the shoulder with a rifle. It struggled to pull its paw from the mass of logs, but managed and approached the rescue party. A second shot deterred the bear and scared it off, giving the crew the precious opportunity of getting to Elizabeth. Albert and two of the men made an effort to move some of the logs just enough for one of the paramedics to get through and tend to her leg. When he disinfected it and stopped the bleeding, they all started heaving the logs away. This was a long and painful ordeal for Elizabeth as she felt every weight shift on her mangled leg. This was made no better by the adrenaline in her system letting up and worsening the pain. Eventually, however, the group cleared the logs and carefully carried Elizabeth up the hill. She stabilized when they carried her to the waiting ambulance and was admitted to the nearest hospital. Her friends stayed with her and they profusely apologized for suggesting the ATVs and for staying out for so long. Elizabeth was understanding and did not blame her friends in the slightest. However, she did vow never to sit on an ATV again. Story 3. Mark Johnson Our third and final story takes us through all three planes of nature, the sky, earth, and water. On March 2, 1988, Mark Johnson, a bush pilot tasked with flying some equipment from Hemlock Valley to Brookmere, Canada, would find himself in a battle for his life where every second matters. Mark was 39 years old and had been a bush pilot for over a decade, so he was experienced enough to frequently fly these routes. Despite this being a routine flight, Mark made a habit of never slacking on protocol, so he always carried emergency equipment and countermeasures for bears and wolves such as bear spray and a revolver. The flight that put Mark's life on the line began early in the morning of March 2nd and lasted two days. He started in Hemlock Valley as there was enough room for his plane to move around and accelerate enough to take off. It was a small equipment shipment, so loading everything onto the plane took no time. Within an hour, Mark was already in the sky and on a course for Brookmere. Everything was going smoothly for the first 30 minutes of the flight, but Mark noticed some irregularities in his plane's movement. Turbulence wasn't the issue, as the wind was favorable, but the plane was still bobbing up and down more and more forcefully. This was manageable, but Mark could not foresee what would happen next. His engine started billowing smoke. This was the worst possible outcome for Mark, as he realized there was no saving the plane so he had to act quickly. He pulled the parachute from underneath his seat and put it on. In the same movement, he took a small pack containing a revolver, bear spray, and a first aid kit. The engine let off more and more smoke, 
so Mark used the last of the engine's potential to launch the plane much higher in the sky and made for the door. He jumped from the plane and pulled the ripcord on his parachute. He was falling too fast. As the parachute deployed, it barely slowed his fall enough before he crashed through a mass of branches and fell unconscious. He later awoke to a feeling of falling and being pulled down. He looked through the haze as he realized he was hanging horizontally by his parachute's cords. Upon further inspection, he could see nothing to his sides, but he was suddenly pulled by his boot and could finally see what was messing with him. It was a massive grizzly bear, curious about him and wondering if he was food. Mark instinctively screamed and flailed his legs away from the bear. He spun around and got himself tangled in the cord. The bear backed down to the ground, but it was quickly back on its hind legs and growling at Mark. A swift slash of its claws grazed Mark's calf, flaying the skin away and gushing blood. He screamed in pain, but there was nothing for him to do. Struggling, he pulled one of his arms free from the paracord and attempted to reach for his revolver. It fell out of the pack. Mark sighed in disbelief as the bear sniffed at his best chance of escaping the situation. Thinking quickly, he clutched the pack strapped to his hip so the bear spray wouldn't fall to the ground. He pulled the spray out and got ready for the bear. His leg was still burning with pain, but he had to push through it, otherwise he would not leave the tree alive. The bear was back in a standing position again and tried to pull him down again. It managed to grab onto his other leg and his thigh. Despite the strong claws slashing him again, Mark managed to get close enough to spray the bear directly in the face. It roared and moved away from him, bobbing its head up and down to recover. With these precious seconds on his side, Mark quickly grabbed his pocket knife and bunched up the paracord. He slashed at it and the strands began to thin and break one by one. He fell to the ground directly on his shoulder, but the adrenaline in his system made him only think about one thing, the gun. He dived for the revolver and rolled on his back toward the bear. As his hands fumbled with the grip on the gun, the only thing he saw was a massive furry shape overwhelming him. The bear had recovered quickly and was furious. It pulled Mark and tossed him aside like he was nothing. It pressed on him with all its weight and Mark could feel his bones breaking as he screamed in pain. He gripped the revolver tightly and made one last effort to turn around. Mark succeeded and shot the bear multiple times in the chest. The bear staggered away, huffing and grunting, giving Mark a chance to get away. He clambered across the ground, barely managing to stand up and limp away from the scene. He spotted a river about a hundred yards away and limped as fast as possible. The bear retreated into the woods, but Mark could still see it behind him. He rushed forward and let himself fall into the river to be carried off by the current. The cold water shocked his wounds, but he gritted his teeth, looked in front of himself, and floated on his back. He saw the bear on the river's shore with one glance behind himself, but it didn't try to follow him. Mark floated down the river, avoiding rocks as much as he could, but the blood he was losing made him dizzy. Eventually, he passed out because of the cold river and the blood loss. The only reason he's alive today is that a hunter miraculously found him. The man who found him said he was shocked to find him just floating against a rock like that, but he made the right choice of helping him and calling emergency services. Mark was taken to the nearest hospital where his wounds were treated. He regained the use of his arms and legs, but the hypothermia is what really got him. He had floated in the river for an unknown amount of time, but it was enough for his toes and a couple of fingers to irreparably freeze, so they had to be amputated. This meant that he could not work as a bush pilot anymore, so he managed how he could and found a simple office job, but still works with planes. <laughs>